Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the next webinar in the landscape track of our industry insight series that will continue weekly until April 6 of 2021. I want to thank Ewing Irrigation and Landscape Supply for sponsoring the series. This webinar will be a panel discussion titled COVID-19, a response from state landscape associations. My name is Mike Temple, the IA's Technical Program Director, and I have just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. This session will be recorded and all phones will be muted. This webinar is worth one CEU and you can enter it on the Submit CEUs page under the Certification tab on the IA website at irrigation.org. A certificate of attendance will be sent to you within a week of the live webinar date. Uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end of this webinar, so if you have any questions, please type them into the question box on the right hand side of your screen and we'll address your questions then. You will receive a survey following the conclusion of the webinar. I encourage you to complete the survey. It provides us valuable input that we will use to develop new educational products for you. Our moderator today is Jeff Stone, and now I'm going to turn it over to you, Jeff. Well, great, Mike. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'm Jeff Stone. I'm the executive director of the Oregon Association of Nurseries. And out here in Oregon, we're the largest uh, sector of agriculture in the state of Oregon and the third largest nursery state in the country. And so we have an all-star cast here. Uh, the COVID-19 issue really hit everybody hard, states, provinces so we have an international affair for you today and so i couldn't be more pleased to, to uh, uh to have this group assembled and we'll we'll go through a series of a couple questions uh and we want to leave as much time for q a for you as possible so do type in your questions and uh we'll be happy to answer them so we'll go to self introductions now and we'll go to ken fisher Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Mike. Hey, everybody. Ken Fisher here. I'm president and CEO of American Hort, uh, National Trade Association in the Greenhouse Nursery and Landscape Association area. We also have Horticultural Research Institute as our research arm, and I also spend time as the executive director for Ohio Nursery and Landscape Association. And uh, this past six or seven or eight months with COVID has been an interesting time for trade associations, and I appreciate being invited to be a part of this panel. Look forward to this discussion. Thanks, Jeff. Great. Uh, Joel Beetson and Scott Grams. Bonjour. Hi. I'm Joel, uh, the ex Executive Director, CEO of Landscape Alberta uh, and Landscape Saskatchewan. It's 15 degrees uh, Fahrenheit here this morning, so uh, uh, you know where I am, the frozen north. I'm Scott Grams. I'm the Executive Director of the Illinois Landscape Contractors Association. It's uh, slightly warmer here outside of Chicago. Um, I've been with the association since 2009. I've seen a lot of ups and downs in this industry, but I've never seen anything like this past year. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to going over it with all of you. Vanessa Finney, and last but not least, my partner in crime, Cassie Larson. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Vanessa Finney. I'm the Executive Director of the Maryland Nursery Landscape and Greenhouse Association and the Executive Vice President of the Mid-Atlantic Nursery Trade Show, commonly known as MAMPS. Happy to join you all. Hi, everyone. My name is Cassie Larson, and I'm the Executive Director at the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape uh, Association. And uh, Joel, it's snowing here today. Uh, we're supposed to get two to five inches, so, you know, uh, go cold north. Yeah, thanks, climate change. Uh, so, uh, Cassie and I are also the worst pool players on the history of our continent. Uh, that's pretty true. Uh, so, uh, we really want this to be conversational, and that's how we intend to do it. And so, uh, let's start with this first question, and then feel free to jump in. Approximately. What date did your members actually open back up? And what was the effect on your overall season? Scott Grams. Well, we actually were never really closed here in Illinois. Um, so I always kind of frame the COVID around March 11th, which was uh, that kind of that night when everything fell apart, where President Trump came on television and closed the border from Europe. Um, Tom Hanks got COVID, they canceled the NBA season. I think everyone kind of remembers that week when it just kind of went into abject terror. 
Um, technically, the first municipality that uh, flirted with a shelter in place order was the city of Oak Park, which is a suburb of Chicago, and that was March 19th. So it was actually a very short time frame um, where they started to talk about essential businesses and, and moving to that shelter in place type order. So we really had just sort of like one ambiguous weekend where we didn't know if we could work. And actually landscaping was on the wrong side of the ledger um, when it came to the state's stay at home order, which came very quickly. In fact, Oak Park ended up shelving their order because the state was moving quickly on theirs. Um, and two things that were very serendipitous that happened. One, we had a snow event that weekend. So we kind of told the governor's office that we were going out there to plow snow. It's an emergency management function. We feel it's an essential service. That I think kind of got our foot in the door. And then the second thing that happened was, you know, that, that put me in touch with the governor's um, policy director. And I, I still remember as we were debating and she was telling us no landscape services would not be considered essential. I was out walking my dog and uh, as luck would have it on a Sunday, a tree care company was taking down a massive maple tree out of the parkway. And I snapped a picture of that and I ran back and I, I sent it to the governor's office and I said, this is exactly why we need to be working. She told me to sit tight and the next day we were deemed essential. Awesome. Vanessa. Hi, much like um, Scott, we, we here in Maryland were essential all the time um, from the ag sector, the, the growers through landscape contractors, arborists and retail. So never a full shutdown of our industry. However, there were there was some confusion and some issue of for garden centers in particular as to whether or not they could be open or not. The executive orders from the governor's office were kind of vague about any retail establish, establishments should be closed, but agriculture was essential and the retailers were selling, you know, vegetable plants and pet food and that sort of thing. So for the most part, I think our retailers did stay open. Many had to learn how to pivot, if you will, and learn how to survive doing curbside pickup or online with um, delivery service. And that was really hard for folks, for some folks, I should say. And there was also some had maybe a little bit of an ethical issue. I think that's the best way I could say this, where the governor was asking people to stay home. So a retailer in particular might have an issue with opening their store and encouraging customers to come in when the governor is trying to get people to stay home. So I know some of that was going on as well. And there was, you know, if you were a retailer, you potentially could be excoriated by the consumer population for being open. Um, our members dealt with all sorts of things, um, but fortunately for the industry, they were able to stay open. I think here it kind of hit, March 16th was the first day that the governor kind of made some noise about uh, staying home and having shutdowns, but it was March 23rd before the first formal executive order came in to um, stay home and close some businesses. Excoriated is a fantastic word. Let's go up north to Joel and then Cassie. Yeah, we had a, you know, a very similar response. We never fully shut down. Um, we had a couple of uh, quasi definition issues around garden center retail around the ag sector um, but we were kind of blessed with a really slow start to spring this year uh, we actually had our uh, spring conference on March 11th so the you know our last public event and I, I flew home that day um, from an event and then um, and then everything shut down um, but we really didn't as an industry the green industry we didn't start to open until um, much closer to um, uh, middle of April so we had a few weeks there to to deal with the the legislative side of it uh, and get get people well prepared. And I think we were able to really think about how to open um, for online pickup at garden centers and do those things. And people had some chance to to uh, to rush implement an online ordering system or or do those things before it was the height of the season. And I know you know through this group we were able to see in the southern states where they were full blast at that point how much that was an interruption whereas we got that that nice slide in and then it just translated into one of the best seasons people have had in years and most some people reporting like the best season the best season in 60 years of operations um this year so um 
I'm pretty happy we had snow on the ground still until mid-April. Cassie. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so unlike many of you, we, um, we flip-flopped in Minnesota from being open to being closed to being open to being closed. Um, around about March 18th, um, our governor came out with his uh, first executive order, and we had to start uh, flipping into uh, major advocacy mode to be uh, to talk about what was a, an essential business and what was not an essential business. Um, our growers were actually fine the whole time. Um, they were able to operate um, without any restrictions, given that they were put into the agriculture sector. Um, but, uh, and, and at first, when our governor's executive order came out, landscapers were deemed essential. And then basically in the process of overnight, uh, them updating the list, the very next morning, um, suddenly we were deemed not essential. <laughs> so while we thought we were, we were okay, uh, suddenly we had to flip back in to advocacy mode um, and uh, go at it hot and heavy again. It wasn't until April 8th that uh, all of our members were officially deemed essential and we could move forward. Garden centers with the restrictions of curbside and retail limitations, similar to other retail establishments as well. Um, but uh, it certainly was uh, probably some of the hardest work uh, that we've ever done on the advocacy front uh, as an association that that two weeks time felt like uh, two years worth of work. Absolutely. And from the national perspective, Ken, uh, what did you see? And then I'll go with Oregon just very quickly. Yeah, you know, same song, similar verse. Let me start with Ohio first. Our governor, DeWine, was very quick to close schools, to shut everything down very aggressively. And, and the orders that came out, uh, other than agricultural growers, which our, our, our um, greenhouse and nursery growers fell into nicely, Landscape and retail was was less than clear. Um, we very quickly got into the governor's staff asking, you know, tell us specifically, um, can we say they're essential? And basically, we got the word back is we're not we're not we're not going to parse it that way. So both on the state level and on the federal level, we then quickly pivoted to say, look, how do we do this as safely as possible? And the people on this panel were very instrumental in putting together the guidelines for what does it take to do garden center retail safely, whether it's order online and pick up curbside or whatever it looks like. Um, same thing with landscape, you know, how do you how do you do this so that it, it passes any question that anyone would ask? And even the growers, I mean, there's so much plexiglass and hand washing stations and, and changing production schedules and production lines. I will tell you, I was extremely impressed with our industry um, who very, very quickly at sparing almost no expense, everybody I talked to, to the, to the company took this seriously. They were protecting their, their employees and their customers. Our industry showed up big. Uh, and, and instead of in most cases, I mean, there were some governors we worked in, we worked in Pennsylvania, we worked in Michigan, we worked in Florida at the federal level to try to make sure that we were working with, and some of you to get um, the, the, the governors to, to actually parse out what was right or wrong. Um, but in most cases, if you can do it safely, you can justify being opened. And to, to Scott's point, um, most of the landscapers were out there doing essential work. Um, all the growers were out there doing essential work and it really came down to garden retail. And our job at the national level was to do everything we could to keep the supply chains open. And it's just a, it's just a hats off to all of our state and local groups that made sure that the, the 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 best practices were out there established, put in writing, uh, and that's what kept our supply chain open. And like the rest of you, it was a couple of weeks of of almost panic because if our supply if our retails are shut down, if our landscapes are shut down, it backs up the whole supply chain. And to to Cassie's point, our our state and federal advocacy teams with NALP and the rest of the group just did a fantastic job guiding our industry in the right direction. And I'm very proud to be a part of that. For the state of Oregon, thank you, Ken. Uh, for the state of Oregon, we had a board meeting on March 10th, March 13th, um, the state shut down. And we had our Scooby-Doo moment of row, row <laughs> you know, what, what is gonna go on? And there was a whole bunch, a lot of states were saying what was um, open 
and our governor was making noises about what would be closed. And I, I'll say that I was a little reticent with Governor Brown, Kate Brown from Oregon about that approach. But actually, in hindsight, it, it was pretty forward thinking because people had certainty. Uh, omission is permission. And while there's no good time for a pandemic, certainly one of this nature and size and scope, it hit. The nursery, we, we, we ship 80% of what we grow out of the state and it hit right during shipping season, right when things are getting going. So to say that there was uncertainty uh, would be an understatement, much like my colleagues here, those two weeks uh, seemed like an eternity. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I think Ken points to this, that the, the, the groups, and we'll get into this in just a little bit about how the groups interacted with one another, supported one another. Up and down the supply chain was an easy way to talk about this issue. We had, we had struggled with our um, legislature to talk about the supply chain, especially as it comes to tax policy, right? Because they just don't get it. Uh, only three of them have ever signed the front of a paycheck. And so they don't get that part. Um, but this was a great opportunity to show how the supply chain is really so intertwined. So. One last thing, and then we'll go uh, uh, to the next question, is that we had a truck leave Oregon and then four days later get turned around in New York because New York had changed their status uh, between the time that the truck had left and by the time it arrived. And so that, that level of uh, uh, just fear and uncertainty really played a big part in the associations really stepped up to the plate and i'm exceptionally proud of everybody that's on this call for their role in helping out everybody just not their own state or province so we're a member we're all membership organizations um and we heard i mean oregon had a really good year growers had they feel guilty almost that they had a really good year a lot of our retailers who were able to stay open did the same what about membership in the organization? I mean, if there's any time to show ROI, return on investment, to the membership, this is kind of it. So uh, let's go in inverse order uh, and go Ken and then uh, Cassie, and then we'll go back. We'll we'll go backward. Sure, thanks, Jeff. At the at the state level, um, we've seen a little bit of a bump, uh, but a strong appreciation from the members. Um, you know, we, we can point to a handful um, of new members from, uh, because a, a lot of the things we did at both the Ohio level and the American Hort level, we opened up to, to, to everyone. We didn't lock anything down just to members. Um, but we've seen a huge appreciation for what we did. At the, at the, federal, at the, at the American Hort level, um, we've actually seen a, a, a large acknowledgement. It hasn't realized in a large number of new members, but we have seen membership grow and we have a couple of levels. We have a pre premium level that supports a lot of our advocacy and just a basic level. And we've seen, you know, a dozen or more people that have moved from one to the next um, because they've recognized the fact that um, without advocacy in this time, without understanding how the CARES Act works, without understanding how all the labor issues work, without understanding how the PPP loans work, without understanding how the PPP loan forgiveness, with, without all of those webinars and the programming, while probably they could have figured those things out, having direct access and online videos to, to figure those things out, um, we've seen a, a, a strong appreciation and some growth in membership on both the state and federal level. Well, your sharing of Keiko Isom's expertise on the PPP and all those things and made it available to all industry members regardless of their affiliation with the national association i can't tell you how valuable that was so let's go to cassie then joel yeah so i'll reiterate something that ken said and that was we made a decision very early on right away that we were not going to put any walls around the information that we were distributing that it was so important that anyone in the industry had this information um, that we were just going to make it widely publicly available um, and I think that that, you know, certainly was a benefit to the association in the long run. One of the things we did right away was build a, a Facebook group uh, for members um, to distribute information. And uh, while we advertised it to members, we also invited 
uh, anyone who was a non-member who attempted to join that group, we said, sure, come on in, see what we have to offer, um, and uh, you know, please consider membership in the future. And I think that's probably one of the best things that we did um, because uh, many of the people we saw joining that group later on, we saw membership applications come through for those folks. Um, so, you know, I would estimate that we probably got between 25 and 50 new members out of our advocacy work uh, related to COVID-19. While it's always hard to say exactly why a member joins um, and, you know, connect it exactly to one thing or another, um, certainly it, it, it played a big role. And then also just hearing from our current members about um, how thankful they were for the work that we did. We um, collected uh, some of the notes that members sent us, and we actually published four pages in our magazine of uh, thank you notes that we got from members for the work that we did. Um, and so while that two weeks felt like two years, certainly the work paid off, and um, I'm so glad that we were able to help the industry come through in a very uh, tight pinch of a situation. Joel and Vanessa. Yeah, it's more of the same, um, but it's, uh... Uh, we we made all the resources available to anybody that wanted to access them and actually took some flack from from sister associations in the province and related industries that we were being so generous. Um, I had a couple of angry executive directors um, call me and ask me why we were giving things away, um, which we just said it was a moral obligation to help anybody um, um, through this process. Um, and then, um, you know, we just we haven't seen a, a spike in membership. We've just seen really solid renewal numbers. Obviously, anybody that is a member, the argument for why why to renew the season is is made for us. Uh, a, they're having a great year, and B, we we took such direct action. It was it was it's a pretty obvious uh, case. So we still need we're having our big um, fall event switching to virtual this year, and I think that's going to be our chance to to roll the membership thing is is if at the end of 2020 if you don't see the value in in the association uh we've just given you the best year in history to be to, to why we exist and why we're important so join up so we have pre-roll videos going before every speaker uh, that are going to push that idea that's a really good idea uh vanessa then scott good so um when this initially started we were trying to digest all the information that was coming out of the governor's office and push it out to the members so that they could understand it and you know have it quick and easy something to do action plan and we were fielding an awful lot of phone calls from non-members which is absolutely fine we do it all the time but this was a lot of people calling the office so we like literally within two or three days just created a complimentary membership for because we wanted to gather, we wanted as many people in our network as possible so that we were sharing the same message with as many folks as possible efficiently. So we've to date taken in 149 new members because of that, the comp membership. And at the same time, early on, it was right before Easter and the industry was kind of freaking out because they weren't sure they were gonna be able to remain essential. Pennsylvania, our neighbor to the north, put a lot of their industry as non-essential for a long, long time. And of course the distribution channels north of us were closed. So a lot of our um, greenhouse growers, for instance, were not shipping their product for Easter and for early spring sales. So people were kind of freaking out here in Maryland about having uh, dumping their inventory and, and huge, huge economic losses. So to just help a little bit, we ceased, um, renewal payments for all of our members at the time and gave everyone a free year if they were a current member. It's only a you know, few hundred dollars, $500 at the most, I guess. It's not huge, huge sums of money, but we thought it might help a little bit. And then it turns out, you know, everyone's having going gangbusters this year. So that initial period was you know, really, really hard, fraught with a lot, a lot of angst that I can't even minimize that at all. I mean, it's huge. You all know that. Um, and Fortunately, we're here on the back, or well, not on the back end, who knows where the back end is, but we're getting through this and the industry is having a darn pretty good year. So that's that's what we did. The, the proof will be when these complimentary members have to 
pay for real, and that'll be effective at the end of December. So we will see. I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to retain a lot of them, of course. Uh, Scott? Um, yeah, we, we had our best membership retention year ever. Um, and, uh, you know, oftentimes we'll have attrition of 75 to 100 members. We're talking about attrition of a couple of dozen. Um, and also we probably picked up about, you know, 60 to 75 new members at full cost, especially from some of the um, specialty trades, such as lighting, lawn care, irrigation, who kind of saw our organization as representing their interests, even though we are the Landscape Contractors Association. Um, and to tell you the truth, we, we deserved it. Um, I, I think, you know, one of my favorite quotes is do something every day for your customers that makes you irreplaceable. We were doing, I think, as a state association and all my counterparts across the country in Canada, we were doing 10 things a day uh, to, to make us irreplaceable to our members. And we were pumping that information out to our members and, and as we said, non-members as well. And I think, you know, it took the courage of our leadership, our staff, all of our volunteer committees um, who just sort of kept that information train going, especially during a time when our members are at their busiest. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes this industry has this um, mentality that it's the low man on the totem pole. It has this little man's complex that it's not professional enough. And I think what we saw from this, from the national associations all the way down to the smallest state organizations is that we handled this very professionally. We shared information and also, you know, we put thousands, hundreds of thousands of professionals out into the field during the first few weeks of a pandemic where people were afraid to open their mail. And we equipped our members with tools that they could then promote themselves to their clients and to the public to say, this is why we're out here. And I think that equipping them with those resources to, to improve their image being out there. And then also our members being professional enough to stay out there. We didn't have these widespread outbreaks within landscape companies. And I think if you need more <laughs> examples of how professional this industry is, you can find it within the last six to seven months. I think this, should, this industry should be very impressed with itself. Thank you, Scott. Um, and you really have a great transition here about how we all collaborated with one another. And uh, Cassie, why don't we start with you kind of framing it because we, uh, you are a critical part of this. Yeah, so, you know, in the very early days, for those who are listening, um, who may not know, there is an association that exists that is called the Nursery and Landscape Association Executives. Um, and that is an organization that we, as your staff of your state, provincial, national associations belong to. Uh, typically, we get together once or twice a year, um, sometimes online, sometimes in person, to uh, to share initiatives that we're working on, to talk about uh, ways that we can collaborate, to learn together, um, and to share war stories. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, it, it certainly was to this industry's benefit that the people on this call, and a much wider group as well, that we all know each other. Um, and so when, when all of this started to hit, um, I picked up the phone, and I called Jeff Stone and I said, we got to do something because we're all facing the same challenges um, and we need to talk to each other about it because there's a lot we can learn um, from different parts of the country because we're all going to see the same thing come through eventually. And so uh, we started talking about what would be the best way to facilitate that. Um, and what we decided is let's put together a, a, a weekly call. Um, on Fridays where we can all hop on and touch base um, and sort of triage the COVID-19 situation as it currently exists and as it moves its way across the country. Um, and I think it's probably one of the best decisions that we made um, probably within the first couple of days of the pandemic um, because we were able to very quickly and very clearly get a picture of how this thing was going to move um, across the country. So um, I'm glad that we could we could certainly do that, um, and we also uh, played a lead role uh, together in putting together a map, which I'm sure Jeff is going to talk about maybe uh, at the end of this section as well. So I am so grateful uh, for all of uh, my colleagues 
and for everyone's willingness to share uh, because you know what worked in one state certainly we could take some of that advocacy knowledge and bring it over into another state or a province um, and uh, we continue those meetings uh, today although with a bit less frequency thank goodness uh, I don't uh, not that I don't love seeing y'all but uh, you know uh, with a little less thanks is certainly appreciated so well, this is, uh, and the cool thing is that there was a triage group, that's what kind of what we called each other, um, that involved state associations, pro provincial uh, uh, associations, and then really the big national associations because we wanted to be as seamless as possible. So I give Ken Fisher uh, Irrigation Association, uh, now uh, all credit for coming to the table. Um, and and really helping because hoarding information during a pandemic is probably the worst thing. Uh, Joel talked about being a moral obligation. I agree 100%. Um, any other initial uh, comments about the collaboration? And I'll, I'll ask um, uh, good old Mike Temple to pull up the map so people who are watching this can see it. Uh, oh, he's doing it right there. So um, here's what Cassie was talking about. Um, this actually was born, this map concept was born through Cheryl Gore in the great state of Arizona uh, through Plant Something, which was a opportunity for retailers to uh, put themselves on a national map. So if you would click like on the state of, uh, let's just do Minnesota because we love Minnesota. And... Okay, well, we're seeing if Mike can find the state of Minnesota. Uh, so uh, I was pretty good at geography. It's just a little. No, no, it's okay. it's okay. I should. I was going to pick Oregon because you know we're basically, uh, you know, Washington's Mexico. Uh, so uh, we this map tried to look at a couple different things about what state borders were in. Uh, can you enlarge that a little bit, brother Matt? Yeah. Let's um, see. Well, that's so what the state orders are, um, the associations worked hand in hand on resource pages. So Cassie, Cassie is awesome. And so I really, we fashioned our resource page after her, and then we openly shared it with all the execs and say, look, just replace Oregon and put your own uh, state or province in there. And so it had up-to-date resources um, and then who to call, right? So Cassie would be the person to call. And then the big thing was trying to figure out how to categorize things. I mean, Ken's right, I mean, it's the supply chain, right? So we put like landscaping, um, trucking, all those type of things in the land uh, in the landscaping supply chain. We had, of course had the retailers, uh, greenhouse operations and growers since everybody was very different from one another. Um, mm -hmm. The cool thing is that this was updated on the state and provincial end, so it did not have to have a, a, a delay in it being applicable. So you could click on any of these states to see what was open uh, and what was closed. Or you go to the, you know, there were a lot of questions about uh, shipments into Canada. And so um, a lot of unknowns. And, and really the rumor mill was outpacing the facts. And so this was a way um, to really short circuit any misinformation to my growers have said outwardly, this was the game changer for their survival this year. And so I welcome anybody else's um, comments because my dogs are about to go crazy because my wife's coming in the door. <laughs> Don't unmute. I think the resource the resource sharing was incredible, but the 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 thing I found we try to sell it as part of our associations often, right? Is the fraternity, the the networking that happens. And that was undeniable amongst the, the group of execs. Um, that first four weeks, six weeks of the pandemic was uber stressful for all of us. We were doing, you know, uh, 12 months worth of uh, advocacy work in two weeks. And and many of us had kids home that uh, that weren't doing that and closing offices and, um, but also worrying about our members and making sure their businesses could stay open. And I just think like that, that group coming together and just supporting each other was, was invaluable to, to my mental health and 
um, and overall sanity. Um, but it certainly puts it into a, into place the value of the association during those times too. Is is having peers that are going through the same stresses, the same difficulties, is is an invaluable thing, and it's one we have a hard time trying to sell. Uh, normally, and Jen just peeked over your shoulder, Jeff. Yes, she did. Um, that was my wife, Jennifer. Yes. Yeah, I, I you know I've I've been working with the landscape industry now for over ten years, and I, you know the the landscape industry and the green industry has this bizarre quirk where you guys actually like each other, and you 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 share information uh, across competitors. And, and I don't know if that is a function of the trade association reflecting on the members or the members reflecting on the trade association, but you can't ever lose that. I, I actually used to work for uh, the Road Builders Association here in Illinois, and we're talking big, massive companies who do a lot of multi-million dollar projects, and those guys hate each other, and they never share information. And that's all sealed public bid. And here you have a truly competitive industry that shares information all the time. And that is the absolute lifeblood of why the landscape industry is so refreshing to work in. And, and I think that's reflected at the association level as well. And so uh, it's, it's the greatest gift that the, the landscape and nursery industry have, and I hope it's never lost. Yeah, that, that's a, those are all great points. You know, to, to, you can manage risk, but it's hard. You can't manage uncertainty and you have to go out and seek out as much knowledge as you can. And, we found our we all found ourselves in just uncertain times. We weren't sure what was going to happen tomorrow, what would be open, what would be closed. And I think what we found in this group across the country was, you know, we were discovering best practices daily. Um, we were discovering, you know, what what do you what can you say to a governor's office to try to get a retail channel open? What's the best practice for, you know, for for landscape contractors and using P PPE? Um, and the, this, this whole collaborative process of finding the best practices and putting it all together and, and just hats off to this group for meeting weekly and, and sharing, sharing all that and then putting it all together, it did make a difference. And we, what, what one of us could have done over a period of weeks, together we did in a period of days. And I think it did make a big difference for our industry. I don't know that we'll get full credit for being able to do that and move that quickly, um, but it is a good feeling to, to know that you know, when you're sitting in your work office or your home office because there's a pandemic, it's nice to know that there are dozens of other, you know, strong leaders in our industry, leading associations with the same type of goals uh, that we can work to together to try to solve these things. So I would say good, good job for us. We didn't waste a pandemic. So I just uh, hurt my shoulder. On the back. Out of your back. Yeah, oh, you deserve you deserve a lot of credit in the role of the national associations to give us perspective as we're all kind of inundated with our own particular situations. That the cool thing that it was very egoless, and uh, and the one thing that no one circles the wagons uh, like this group. And when the state of Michigan was having some severe difficulties. Um, huge swings in in what was open and closed. Uh, Amy, the, the exec over there, we all felt for. And the thing is, is that this group rendered aid, rendered not only aid in terms of, hey, here's what worked for us to talk to your governor uh, or, and your decision makers or your department of bag, um, but we we got your back. And that that to me. There are things you can manufacture, you can manufacture cooperation, but when it's genuine, um, that really resonates. Uh, and so uh, no one was left behind. And 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 I think was mentioned that from the very smallest of associations, I think it was Scott, um, they can get feel very overwhelmed quite quickly. And the fact is that you gave there's a template and more so access and talking to. Um, your colleagues to try to get through. Anything else before we um, start moving? You, I think we can close the map now, uh, Brother Temple. Um, any, anything um, else that we would like to talk about in terms of what it was like going through those early days um, and kind of how the association has managed through those times? And then we can go to Q&A uh, if there are any questions, Mike. Um, 
that we're happy to answer. I want to make sure that we dedicate enough time for that. Yeah, we don't have any questions coming in yet, but everybody remember, if you do have a question, type it in the box um, and we'll we'll get to it here in a couple of minutes when we get to the Q&A part. This group has no problem talking too. We can, we can go. Uh, so let's talk about, um, we talked a little, we hit upon it, the trade shows. Um, talk about uncertainty and each state has their own um, gathering limitation so let's quit i don't want to have this this is this is truly where the eor moment will be um but i don't want to focus too much on kind of the calamity of it all but because I, I think we should transition to what we what can others learn from our experience and kind of what's happening right now in your state so those let's try to conflate those two things if we can in a semi semi cogent manner um so uh I'm not going to call them, folks. Let's just go ahead and go. Um, one of the one of the things that I think every organization should put together at the state level is kind of that 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 O oh, ship uh, list of legislators and decision makers who you have their personal cell phone numbers. You can send them a text immediately. You know who are your five to seven lawmakers that are in your corner. Um, you know the next crisis may not be a pandemic, but it's going to be something. And the state organizations, I think, realize, you know, we were unashamedly aggressive towards lawmakers during that time because we were talking about the survival of thousands of businesses and thousands and thousands of jobs. And I think that um, having that already queued up your in case of emergency break glass plan for dealing with your local officials. Um, but then I think the trade off for us has also been you know, now we are walking a very ethical line when it comes to the state guidelines. You know, Illinois has very um, high threshold um, to have events and things like that. You know, we're still capped at 50 people. Um, and so we're not gonna get cute with those guidelines because the state didn't get cute with us. And I think that's the trade-off that we have to do. So um, I'm sure it's the same with other organizations as well. Awkward silence. <laughs> You're going to fill it, aren't you? Um, that's that's a good point. We, I mean, we we've got those kind of um, similar guidelines in place, and we just we're not going to flirt with the idea of trying to to do some incredible gymnastics, trying to hold a physical event um, and get around those guidelines. Uh, my home city uh, is in the is sort of epicenter right now for second wave here. Um, even after we hosted the Stanley Cup playoffs and had zero cases through that bubble, um, through that 10 weeks or whatever they were they were in case there. So it proved that following guidelines actually did work, and we got through the whole season where none of our members reported any massive outbreaks. And um, so uh, I think we did ourselves a lot of favors with government too of also being uh incredibly reasonable and um uh good negotiators like that that has come back through our health department several times now whenever there's been a little blip they've been really great to communicate with maybe one i mean ken fisher i'm gonna go to you i mean american hort had the unfortunate timing uh of having their traditional big successful trade show um just smothered by the by the coronavirus and so ken do you want to talk about kind of what you guys learned and being really the the first ones in the first ones on the beach right uh to on a virtual trade show yeah so you know i'm i'm fairly optimistic in most things in life uh was pretty sure you know, this pandemic that started in February, March really wasn't gonna last that, that long. So by July, I mean, surely we'll be out of this by July, right? So we put a marker out there about 60 days before our event in July and said, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll put off till then. But it became painfully obvious that if you're gonna be a responsible citizen in the world, you're not gonna bring eight, 10, 12,000 people into a convention center. Oh, by the way, the government, the, 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 the governor wasn't allowing more than at the Scott's point, you know, 30 people together. Oh, and by, by the way, our convention center too was set up with hospital beds for, for half of it. So it was pretty obvious that we weren't going to have an event. And, you know, we believe very clearly that you tell as many people as much as you can, as soon as you can. You know, we don't, we don't want to spread 
false information, but if we know something, we're going to share it with you because that's how you earn trust. And so we got out there as quickly as possible. And I will tell you, we were intimidated by the virtual event. I talked to a lot of people, um, was pretty sure we couldn't do it, to be honest with you, because it, it's a fairly heavy lift. And um, we decided for us that um, we needed we needed at least a, pl a placeholder uh, so that our industry knew that we were still engaged. And we were very fortunate our team stepped up. We locked into a platform that worked. There were, there were three platforms. And at the time we were making the decision in late April, people will stop returning calls because there were so many people going to a virtual platform. So we grabbed one. Uh, they happen to be great partners. Um, guys, we did the best we could, and I'm very proud of our team for doing it. I wouldn't, we didn't hit it out of the park, but we survived. We pulled it off. Um, and while it was probably from an, from a, from an exhibitor standpoint, it was, you know, a third as many exhibitors as we would have in person. We ended up having, you know, eight to 9,000 people register to be on, on the platform. We'd have 4,000 a day. So we had pretty good numbers. Um, the education went well. The the kind of networking went well. It's really hard to do a trade show when people people when in an industry that is very visual and 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 relational to do something like this is is difficult. So I know some of you have tried it as well. Um, we hope we never have to do, do it again. We're we're glad we got the experience. Um, I think overall the industry has a bit of fatigue. Uh, we are fully supportive of Mance and all the programs out there. We're 100% we're in your court. We want to do whatever we can to help. Um, you know, we are kind of like Scott said, we want to be very, very respectful of our communities, our citizens, our industry. We don't want to put anybody in harm's way. Um, and so we have to read the tea leaves here. And, you know, we look a lot at sports and the Ohio governor's got 15,000 fans at a Browns game. 15, you know, that's outdoors. We're, we're getting closer. Um, but I am Some concerned. Years that would have been good. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's big. Um, I am the Browns. We're, we're, we're going to have a, uh, a, a, yeah, the Browns, you don't only get 10,000 people anyway. No, just kidding. Um, I'm concerned we're going to have a resurgence here. And so we'll see what the first of the year brings. Um, but for, and you know, I, I say, I'll stop here in a second. Our industry is high touch. We have plants, we grow things, we do things, we are tactile, we, we, are, we are hugging people. And to go to high tech has been a, a tough pivot for us. Um, I can sense it in our industry, I can sense it in our members. Um, so I hope we get out of it, but you know, we will not do anything that puts people in harm's way. Health and well-being of our families and communities is more important, but we hope to be able to get back to normal as I know the rest of you do as well. I wanna kick it to you, Vanessa. I mean, Scott, Scott Graham's put it right. I mean, they did the governor. The gov government did right by us, and to violate that trust and you know and forget about that extension would be, I think, just a colossal mistake on our part. Yeah. But but both Vanessa and I have trade shows that um, uh, had bad timing, and we didn't uh, we didn't pull the trigger. Uh, I didn't pull the trigger for Far West. I'm happy to talk about that, but like Ken was able to. Um, but Vanessa, what, I mean, your trade show is magnificent and large. Well, I ditto to everything Ken just said, because it's, it's also very true about the industry and how we relate with each other, uh, how we network, how we feed off of each other. We want to see each other in person. And um, I was like going, whew. We got through MANS before this, you know, the pandemic hit, and well, we had got through a big conference we do here in Maryland in February, right before COVID hit. I was like, okay, we're going to be okay. This pandemic will be way gone before January, right? And uh, our convention center is still a field hospital. It's not seeing very much activity at all. However, it's going to remain that way at least through December and perhaps into the first quarter of next year based on all the news we're hearing about the spike and cases going up. So that aside, I know that Mance Board, even if the convention center was open, we would not have done the show in person just because of the health risks and wanting to do the right thing. And we did have a lot of exhibitors calling and emailing saying, please hold the show, please hold the show. We really need the show. We want the show. We'll be careful, yada, yada, yada. So, you know, we couldn't. And I think 
we are doing an online business hub is what we're calling it. It's gonna be a little bit different than what Cultivate did with the visual of going into a booth and, and that sort of thing. But we, we took the time that we had to research various different platforms and just try something. And I think we are getting a lot of support from exhibitors. We're only two weeks into the launch of our platform and having exhibitors sign up. So we've got a little bit of time to go. It's well received so far. And I'm just very hopeful that we are able to keep pushing forward and gaining more momentum as we go along. So far, so good. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. We just opened registration yesterday to attendees, so the attendees can now sign up. Um, but both sides, attendees and exhibitors, will have their own little platform and profile. And through the registration process, both parties, there's an algorithm that runs behind the scenes, and it'll match exhibitors and attendees to the best connections possible. And then you can just do regular generic searches if you want. But that's the basic premise of what we've got going. Um, but really, we felt at the end of the day, you know, we talked about just take, hitting the pause button and doing nothing for the year. And the board really felt that we, and me too, that we need to go forward and do something. And we were getting encouragement from our exhibitors to do something as well. So this is what we came up with. And you know, I hope it's, it's meaningful and purposeful. I, I think it is. I think it can be. We just have to have the core group that believes in it as well. So they do. Uh, I always follow whatever Cassie Larson does. Um, I mean, she, uh, the, the fact is, I mean, I, it's terrible to give you that much pressure, but that you really are an innovator on the technological side. And, and every time I think we're doing okay, and I see what Minnesota is doing, I go, oh, we suck so bad as an association uh, but uh Cass I mean before we go into kind of what lessons we've learned in terms of added you know being adaptive we have uh, a couple minutes late uh, minutes left so I would encourage anybody who has a question to please ask it and then Mike will uh, trigger us to to answer it uh, but Cassie I mean you you really were the lantern in pitch dark night when we were all looking at various um various platforms and kind of and the information sharing when it's really i mean talk about competitors uh you know we we share some of the same markets and same of the same members so um talk to us a little bit about kind of what your process is because i i think you do your thing really well Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, and, and the feeling is mutual. You know, I think the, the the nice thing is that we all we all have our strengths and we all share with one another. So um, uh, I think my background is in um, sort of the tech space. Um, and so uh, that's just an area that's of interest to me. Um, and we uh, started researching, you know, our show is in January. We pull about 6,500 to 7,000 people to the Minneapolis Convention Center in January. And like Vanessa, we were sort of like, oh, whew, we made it through. We're going to be fine by next January. We'll be we'll be OK. And Scott and I have had this conversation as well because he's in the same time frame. Um, but uh, as early as, um, you know, May, we started researching technology, knowing that at some point we may need to pivot. And um, we've come up with kind of making it a uh, a very analytical process. And we as a, an entire staff here in Minnesota uh, sat down very early on and said, if we were gonna adopt a virtual platform in an ideal world, what would we want it to do for us? What, what do we think exhibitors would be looking for? What do we think attendees would be looking for? And we spent some time in conversation with both of those groups, um, trying to figure out what the needs and the wants would be. And uh, we were lucky enough to not be first. So thanks Ken for that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, we were able to attend some virtual shows as well and see what we thought uh, worked really well and what we thought could use improvement. And so um, I put together a report with a colleague here uh, in Minnesota from the Marine Retailers Association, because there's an association for everything. Um, and we uh, we actually did a, a one hour seminar on, you know, how do you select a platform and, and what do you look for and how do you execute a virtual event? 
And that uh, resulted in a white paper, which I was able to share with this group very early on um, as folks were kind of looking at going down the virtual path if need be. Um, so, uh, you know, we as well are going virtual in January. It's just uh, we have a 250 person gathering limit here in Minnesota right now. Um, and while the convention center wanted to convince me we could do that in pods of people, I kept saying, you know, 7,000 people, really? Like, that's not going to happen. Um, we're now on the same page that it's not going to happen. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll be going virtual and um, we're excited to try. You know, I think one thing about associations is we try a lot of things. They don't all work um, and this might not work. Um, but uh, like Vanessa, we felt like we had to try something. Like we have to continue to find a way for members to interact in this, uh, in the new world that we're in right now. And hopefully it's not forever, but for right now, let's deliver something um, and give it our best go. Well, there's tremendous diversity of technological acumen uh, in our industry. And I think Ken pointed to that. Um, and going virtual has certainly been something that's been a challenge, but I also think it's given us some opportunities. We have a, we have a few minutes left and um, would like to go Joel, Scott, and then Ken talk about kind of what things adapted adaptively. I mean, kind of how things are in your area now um, kind of what you see, what's happening around you at the at the moment, and kind of give everybody who is listening or watching just a brief uh, kind of status of, of your particular uh, province or state. You start with me, you said? Yes, please. Okay, no worries. Um, I'll just add uh, to Cassie's last point too, is our convention center wanted, um, their solution was eight foot high plexiglass uh, boxes around every booth. Um, so and with one-way aisles, I was like, "Well, what's the point? Like, that's not a live event, then. If you everyone's in a a cage, well, um, it sounds like it sounds like a penalty yeah. box. I mean, you are well, hockey. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Hockey's the excuse. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah. And so, so we've we've generally have uh, we're about one month exactly uh, to our traditional live event stage, where twenty five hundred people come um, uh, for our our physical event, which has gone fully virtual this year. Um, I think we're, and, and the season's just wrapping up, the ground's starting to freeze, everyone's trying to finish out their season. I think people are worried about where that goes next spring. Do we have these same, are we going to deal with these things again next year? Or are we, are we moving towards some kind of, of transition? Um, we're looking at probably not till next summer to, to the, you know, vaccines are maybe available and, uh, on a wide scale. So we're, we're in it for the long term. It's just a, a matter of uh, of pushing through there. So we're, you know, the lessons learned is, you know, we we reacted really really well to all of this um, as an association and as an industry. I've never been uh, more proud. And and Scott touched on this and Ken um, and Vanessa as well as you know that that nature of um, of our industry and what good people they are is there was not the, the concern was how do I keep my employees safe? Not how do I keep my business going? Um, and that was the, you know, it made it made the 16 hour days uh, worth it uh, uh, through those times because you knew you were doing, you know, good stuff for good people. Um, and I, I talked to uh, other colleagues through the association of, of association executives here in uh, the local chapter. And that experience was unique. Uh, uh, most of them were getting yelled at and were berated um, from their from their constituents, and where we where we were getting nothing but positive uh, messaging in from the members. So, uh, you know, there are strength. Even though we try to do work for them, they're also feeding us uh, yeah. both ways. So. That's a great point, uh, Scott. And then I'm excited to hear Ken. You just guys, yeah, I just announced a a new virtual thing uh, I saw today. So, Scott. Yeah, you can always tell the maybe the optimists or those who are in denial when they say, oh, 2020, like, you know, oh, it'll all be over on January 1st. And I just, I'm just not that optimistic anymore. Uh, I heard a quote, if, uh, you know, COVID's not a crisis, it's chronic. And so it's something that I think we're going to have to just sort of learn to deal with and just become better professionals and better companies. Um, and I, I think we're trying to figure that out every single day. 
um, and adapt our business model. You know, we're not we're not reinventing the wheel. We're reinventing the entire car as it's on the road. Um, and you know, I, I think the lessons that I've realized and pulled from you know just personally is that there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now, and I think it makes a lot of us discouraged and frustrated. And of course, this had to happen in an election year in the United States as well. And I've just realized that you know I'm finding sanity controlling the things I can control. And the rest of the world is going to kind of do what it's going to do. And, you know, by reaching out to the people that are uh, that are on this call, and of course, all the other of my counterparts who are not on this call, they helped me control the things I could control. And, um, you know, I, I found that incredibly re rewarding and helpful. And I think with any business that's that's also dealing with this and going into another uncertain time, numbers in my state are going in the wrong direction. And we're talking about potentially scaling back. You know, we, we just have to continue doing what we were doing, which is be honest, be, tra be transparent, be ethical. Um, and when you when you run out of uh, when you have too many answers to too few questions, you know, you're doing a good job. And I think that's what I've ultimately pulled out of this. Thank you, Scott. Ken. Yeah, similar story. You know, our I told our board last week that our our business model is in person. We're a high touch industry, a high touch business. Our business model, until further notice, is impaired. So the good news is we're learning how to work around that. Um, while we had a few on our staff that weren't too excited about trying to do a virtual event, we learned so much from it. We gained confidence and we did a pivot. And now we're comfortable that we can do more virtual events, they're not the same. They will never be the same. They're hard to monetize. I mean, all of our business models are under a financial stress because we're used to monetizing in-person events. Uh, our industry is not gonna embrace that e immediately, but but it's, it's the mother of invention and we've gotta get better and better at trying to find ways to create value. And I'm, I'm pleased from an industry standpoint and certainly from an American Horse standpoint, we are, we are finding ways to figure out how we create value that people will pay for even if it's nickels and dimes at a time, that's what we're try trying to do. And across the board, they, they appreciate that. They go, I get it. The silver lining, I think, for all of us, at least on the panel here, is our industry has had a very good year. We were all concerned in March that the sky was falling and we were all going to fall into this abyss. And almost to the person, it was a spectacular year. So the underlying foundation of our industry is very strong. And I choose to believe that we'll continue to get the support because we've demonstrated across the industry that we are worth investing in. And while our members are having a good year, they see we may have a, be a little nicked up. I'm confident that they're going to continue to support us through Mance, through the spring, through the summer, through the next season. We talk a lot with our with our growers, especially about how much you're going to grow. You know, what's your what's your point of view? And everybody's pretty bullish right now. Um, but we'll see how the, the year plays out. But the good news is the industry is strong and probably as healthy as it's been in my short time here. So that's a silver lining. We're to Scott's point, we're going to control what we can control. We're going to get up every day and try to create value for our members. And you know what? That's going to be enough and we'll continue to fight on. Thank you, Ken. Let's go Vanessa, mm -hmm. then finish up with Cassie. No, well said, Ken. I, I think that was almost a good place to end. Um, a lot of good thoughts there. I think you know one of the things that we are going to continue to deal with is is this uh, Zoom fatigue, the online fatigue, and is you know, one of the questions we have for Mance and for the MNLGA's February conference is even though there is a level of we want you to do it, we want you to do it, are people going to show up for it? For those events or are they just going to be completely zoomed out i mean we're still talking in events that are four to six months here in the future um the other thing is are we creating or are we on the um you know the genesis of hybrid events or is that are people going to expect us to do things in person and virtually in the future the virtual meetings there's a lot of benefit to that for a lot of people because you don't have to get up and go somewhere there's no commuting it's virtually free no travel you don't have to do hair and makeup you don't have to get dressed on your lower half if you don't even want to you know all those things that people are saying um is that going to be an expectation that we deliver things in a hybrid environment in the future and that is a little bit mentally exhausting when you think about it because it's double the work and not everybody understands that unless you're on the 
and where you're putting that together, it's it's double work and it's 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 not efficient mon monetarily wise. Yeah, so, double cost too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and Vegas Vegas just took a bath because it was Vanessa Finney mentioning uh, the lower 48. So uh, let's go, Cassie Larson, and then Mike is giving me the we are overtime. Uh, so Cassie, stick the landing. Yeah, so I guess I would echo everything everyone else said. I think that we're, as associations, are reinventing our revenue models um, every day, trying to figure out what that looks like, hoping we will get the support of our members to do that. I'm with Vanessa, I think hybrid is the future and trying to figure out how to do that um, in an effective, efficient um, manner is going to be the challenge of our um, of our careers, probably, um, in addition to the advocacy work that we uh, that we undertake on a daily basis. Um, but what I will say most of all is that uh, we all got into this work because we believe in what associations do. We believe in bringing volunteers together. We believe in um, in collaboration. And um, I think uh, that my biggest my biggest takeaway always of this work is that the people in this industry, whether it be in the green industry itself or the people who work in the associations that you see on the screen before you and many who are not, uh, are just some of the best uh, best professional ind individuals um, that I've ever had the chance to work with. So uh, so thank you all for your collaboration through, uh, through the most challenging uh, months of my career. Well, I, I would love to thank our panelists I'd like to thank Ewing uh, as the sponsor. I'd like to thank um, uh, the Irrigation Association for pulling this together. I couldn't be more grateful to be your colleagues and friends. And so really we'll kick it now to Mike because we're over time. Yeah, unfortunately we're out of time. I think we we're having a really good discussion here. Uh, thanks to all you guys, uh, excellent panel. Thanks for your insight and, and continuing to share information. I, I think that's was kind of the the undertone of the conversation this past hour was was everybody working together and, and sharing their war stories what worked what didn't um thank everybody for attending uh definitely big thanks to to ewing uh, landscape and irrigation supply for sponsoring our landscape industry insight series uh, if anybody had any questions please pass them on to educationirrigation.org we'll get it to our panel and get you an answer uh, with that, everybody have a great day, and this is going to conclude our webinar. Thanks. Uh -huh.